Good evening, everybody. Let's get started. I've got a great class today. <clears throat> so let's get started with a couple announcements. Uh, take a look at the schedule on Canvas. So Lab 6 is due this Friday. Pre-Lab 7 and Lab 7, uh, those are posted for this week. Take a look at that schedule. I announced the last class, I'll announce it again, that the exam will be next Wednesday. So we're a week out from, um, from the uh, exam. I will post some review problems and I'll send an announcement out when those get posted. They will be similar to uh, uh, past exams. Uh, the problems will be representative anyway. Let me take a look at the schedule here. And uh, so, so if you have any questions on that, please uh, jump on chat on, um, I'm sorry, uh, Slack, and I'll put a channel up there just for questions about the uh, exam review. Okay, and I'll send more details about that coming up. And someone had a question, do we have a quiz due on Friday? Uh, the answer is no, you do not have a quiz due on Friday. It should be updated on the schedule. Let me know if it's not. Take a look at the, um, I update that PDF schedule periodically, and that usually changes when the assignment dates change. So that should not be up there at this point. So you do not have a quiz on Friday. Uh, professor? Yes. Is the exam next week gonna have like the same time slot as the first exam, 520 to 640? It will. It'll be uh, during class and you'll have a 30 minute grace period after that to submit your exam. Yes. So, uh, and then as always, my office hours will be right after class, so stick around if you want to ask questions or just listen to other people's questions. And the TAs are available uh, on the days that I don't have office hours, so definitely check in with them if you have questions on the lab or, or homework. And as always, uh, unmute if you have any questions during class, and we will discuss. So I wanted to start out uh, today's class looking at uh, a preview of lab seven. So this is the lab you will be starting this Friday. It has to do with diodes and rectifiers. And so on the left, you'll see a big blown up zoomed in picture of, of a diode. And, and that's what it looks like. It should look like that in your kit. You'll notice that one side of this diode is, 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 has a black band. And that indicates the cathode of the diode. So that's how you identify the cathode and the anode of, of the diode based on that black band. So this diode schematic symbol is aligned with the physical diode, just like it should be. And on the right, I have the data sheet. So you'll be using the data sheet to look at the diode uh, voltage and current and do a plot of, of uh, diode current versus voltage based on data sheet values. And what you're going to do in lab is build and measure uh, a DC circuit to show, to demonstrate diode current versus voltage. And you'll also build and measure a rectifier circuit that converts AC to DC. So you'll do that in real life with your, with your lab kit. So the first part of the lab, you'll build this DC circuit where you have a set value VS. Um, and it's, it's just like a circuit we analyzed in class. On the right, you're gonna create this plot of diode current uh, versus voltage to show the characteristic of the diode. And you're gonna measure different positive diode currents and voltage by changing resistor values. And you'll use, um, you'll use that data to create a plot and show that the diode blocks negative current using negative voltage and passes um, current for uh, positive voltage. And you'll be able to see uh, VF. So these are the kinds of oscilloscope traces you should expect. So this is, uh, this is a, a rectifier circuit that you will be building, right? It should look just like the half wave rectifier that you built in class, a diode and a, a capacitor. And so on the left is the AC source simulating the output of a transformer that would be connected to a wall outlet, right? So if a transformer stepped down, we're not gonna talk about transformers, but they step down or step up AC voltage in amplitude. Uh, in this case, we're gonna assume that this transformer uh, steps down DC voltage to five volts peak to peak or 
2.5 volts peak. And then at the output, uh, you're going to see the load voltage versus different capacitor values. So when you have no capacitor, right, this should look a lot like what I uh, drew in class or I tried to draw in class. Uh, this is the this is the output of the rectifier circuit without any capacitor. Below that is the output with a relatively small capacitor showing the charging uh, half cycle or actually quarter cycle of the sine wave and then the exponential decay, that first order decay until that decay hits another charging cycle. And, and so you see this big ripple voltage with a relatively small capacitor. And then as you increase capacitor size, you're going to see that ripple voltage shrink and shrink some more. And eventually it'll be barely perceptible on the oscilloscope when you get a big enough uh, capacitor. Okay, so you're going to demonstrate conversion from AC to DC and different ripple voltages versus uh, capacitor values. I do want to point out the capacitors that you will be using are electrolytic capacitor. There's a there's a chemical um, electrolyte. Ele uh, um, it, it it forms the uh, dielectric uh, between the rolled up plates of this capacitor. When you see a polarity marking on a capacitor like this one or like your capacitors that look like this in your kit observe that in other words you want overall an average voltage the dc voltage to have a negative uh value on, on the negative lead here and then the positive value on the positive lead so all that means is when you build this circuit c1 should have that negative band or the lead associated with that negative band connected to the bottom node here and it, it uh, that's pointed out in the lab, so take a look at that. Just make sure you pay attention to that. Uh, Professor? Yes. It might be hard for me to see from this picture, but how can you tell which one's the negative and which one's the positive? So do you see this kind of whitish band right here? Yes. So right there, that's a negative sign, if you can see that, if it's not too small, right where my mouse is. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yep. So you'll see that band with a negative sign. Some capacitors actually have a plus there, right? And so that's the positive side, but a lot of the capacitors, I, I think all the capacitors in your kit have negative signs. So then it's just whichever lead kind of is in line with that on the... Yeah, you'll notice that this kind of wrapping around the capacitor is this this band is right next to a lead uh, uh, coming out of the bottom. Okay, gotcha. yep. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a preview there. If you have any questions about this, uh, come ask me at office hours. Okay, so let's jump back into op amps. So we finished up transistor amplifiers last time, and we started talking about operational amplifiers. Actually, we finished up with transistor circuits and showed in the linear region of operation for a transistor, you could create an amplifier. And then I said, well, we're going to kind of take an easier approach where we're going to use integrated circuits to um, be a, 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 an integrated circuit inside of an amplifier circuit that we're going to be building. And so these um, op amps function as high gain differential amplifiers. They're created on a silicon wafer, they're cut up into dye and they're put into plastic packages. And so that's where we left off last time. And, and the, big, I, the big takeaway from this slide are these two equations at the bottom. So once you power your op amp with the power supply, uh, the positive supply and the negative supply, then the output voltage will be some gain value, AOL, times the difference between uh, V1 and V2, V1 minus V2. This is a high gain differential amplifier. That gain is big, that AOL is big. It's usually 10,000 to a eh, couple hundred thousand usually. Um, I say up to 10 to the sixth here. If you substitute V1 minus V2 for VID, then you get this other equation, which is equivalent. V out equals AOL times VID. So that's that's at its core what an op amp does. Um, what I'm going to show you is kind of inside this op amp, what's in there, and then talk about using it. So this is a an op amp integrated circuit that would fit nicely on your breadboard, uh, where you could wire it to other circuits. 
And so this is, there's a silicon die in here with wire bonds out to these uh, pins. And actually there are multiple op amps in this package. This package actually has four operational amplifiers inside and you, with a common uh, a power, uh, this would be called VCC, we call it VCC, it's called V plus here. Pin 11 up here is called uh, ground, it's really VEE. -E. I won't go into it in detail, but you could actually apply a negative supply voltage here. But, but what I wanted to show you here is that uh, this chip actually has four op amps in it that you could use for amplifiers, filters, com uh, comparators to compare voltages, and we're gonna talk about those. So, so this is physically what an op amp one type of package looks like. You could also get these as surface mount components that are a lot smaller and, and uh, actually bare die. So, but this is the kind of op amp you would use uh, on your breadboard. Uh, professor? Yes. So you said on the there, there that there's um, how many like inputs and outputs, like technically how many op amps are in there? Well, you have four op amps, so each one of these triangles is an op amp, right? Okay. So let me go. Let me go back to this. Like this, this is what an op amp is, and it has two inputs and one output, and then you have to have uh, supply voltages applied to that op amp. So if I go to the uh, kind of this chip, th this has four op amps. So in other words, if you wanted to use op amp one, you would apply the positive supply voltage, and we'll get to this, is positive supply voltage to pin four, negative supply voltage to pin 11, and then all of these op amps would, would function as op amps. If you wanted to use op amp one, then you'd see that the non-inverting input is at pin three, the inverting input, right, the plus and the minus here, the inverting input is at pin two, and then the output is at pin one. And then you have three other op amps you could use uh, if you needed them in your circuit. Okay, gotcha. So is the, um, are the supply voltages not considered inputs? Are they like considered just supply, like another third? Yeah, they're not really considered an input. I guess you could call them a power supply input, but, but they're not a signal input. They're not like a, a, a voltage that you would amplify, for example. Okay. Um, so, so these would be DC voltages that you set at maybe uh, plus 10 volts, minus 10 volts, and, um, and then the op amps would function. And we'll talk about limitations on that too. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, sure. And so, you know, I, I wanted to show you what's actually, I'll say inside, uh, no, it's actually what's inside this op amp. So that symbol that's drawn on that chip, um, you could expand it out into transistors and current sources. So, so on that, on that silicon die are many transistors. So this is just one op amp. Here are the inputs on the left, the inverting input up top here, the non-inverting input at the bottom, the outputs over here on the right. And so there are stages of amplification and other circuits in order to make this op amp work uh, uh, as, as sort of a black box, right? So instead of having to go build this circuit with however many transistors are here and a capacitor and some current sources, instead of having to do that, you buy this chip and, and this high gain differential amplifier is, is right there for you. Okay. And so we're not going to, we're not going to go into detail about how to build an op amp. Um, as many electrical engineering designers do, uh, they just use op amps. Um, they're available, they are available in different voltage ranges, current ranges, power supply ranges, speed ranges, so lots of different types. We'll talk a little bit about that, but, but I, I wanted to give you a hint of what's inside this triangle. There's a lot of stuff in there. And you start out with a you know, differential amplifier stage at the input and then a driver stage to, draw, to uh, supply current or sync current at the output. And, and the power supply is up at the top here. Here's, here's the power supply at the top and VEE is down at the bottom here. So I just wanted to give you insight into that. That's a typical op amp. Um, okay, so let's, let's kind of back out of this detailed view and talk about how, so I want to kind of combine what these amplifiers do for you, why they're useful and, how to 
analyze a circuit or equivalently design something using an op amp. So here's some guidance for analyzing an op amp circuit or actually also for designing an op amp circuit. Um, and let's start out with the purposes. Why do we use op amps? These are two big reasons, two main reasons for using op amps. Uh, one is to create a circuit that performs a linear function. Okay, that linear function could be an amplifier. Take an input voltage, multiply it by 10, apply it to the output. Okay, so taking maybe an audio signal, make it bigger. Um, a filter, uh, you studied filters a little bit, you could actually put uh, capacitors and inductors in, uh, around op amps and in, in a circuit and create active filters. So the filters actually have uh, a frequency response like you saw with your sinusoid lab uh, and also some gain that can amplify at the same time, but only amplify certain frequencies. So that's one big purpose, this linear circuit function. You could also create summers and subtractors and differentiators and integrators. There's lots of linear functions you can create. Um, the, the other thing you could do with an op amp, the other purpose, is to compare voltages, and that's called a comparator. Comparators compare voltages. We're going to look at both types of circuits uh, in the next day or two. Okay, so let's suppose you have an op amp circuit. Right? You're looking at a circuit, it has that triangle in there, and you need to analyze that circuit. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a decision tree. This is how you decide how you're going to analyze that circuit. Uh, first, you're gonna decide, is this a circuit that creates uh, a linear function, that performs a linear function, or is it a comparator? The way you figure that out is this, and I'm gonna show you how to identify negative feedback, but if that circuit has negative feedback, I'll show you what that means, um, then you have a linear op-amp circuit purpose number one up here, okay? Negative feedback, you can identify it just from, uh, and I'll show you this, some connection from the output to the inverting input through circuit elements. But once you identify that, you've got a linear op-amp circuit. Uh, then that circuit is either going to, uh, you're gonna analyze it using either the negative feedback approach, which I'm going to show you next, or once you've analyzed a circuit, and you recognize it, a common type of amplifier circuit, let's say, then I would call that a common circuit. You've already solved it, you already know the gain equation, so you can just basically write the gain down. So that's one kind of class of op-amp circuits that use negative feedback. The other uh, type of op-amp circuit, right, the one that compares voltages, does not have negative feedback, and it's called a comparator. And we're going to look at two types of comparators. Uh, one type is called the simple comparator. It, it compares two voltages with a single threshold. And the other is called a comparator with hysteresis, okay? So when you have an op-amp circuit, I, I wanted to show you this slide first to show you where we're going. It's either, a, we're, we're, we're going to solve either a linear op-amp circuit or a comparator. Uh, that's one purpose of this slide. The other is to say, you could print this slide out or commit it to memory and you know now which branch of the tree to go down and how to analyze the circuit. And we're gonna talk about the analysis techniques uh, in a minute. So let's talk about analyzing an op-amp circuit with negative feedback. Okay, so I'm going down this left-hand branch here of the tree. So that's what we're gonna talk about now. So I've just drawn an op amp. This is an op amp. I don't have the power supplies shown. That is a common approach, common thing to do for textbook problems. If you don't see the power supplies drawn, just make the assumption that the op amp is sufficiently powered. Okay, so I, I, have a, I have three terminals here, three connections to this op amp, not five. I'm missing my power supplies. 
in a textbook problem or in certain schematics, that's okay because you just assume, okay, someone's powered this op amp, they applied plus 10 volts, plus 15 volts to the positive supply, minus 15 volts to the negative supply, whatever it may be, it's powered. So that's what we're going to assume when you don't have the power supplies explicitly drawn. So let me show you how to identify from this just plain bare op amp how, how, how to figure out if it has uh, negative feedback in its circuit. You have some connection from the output uh, back to the inverting input. Remember the inverting input is the one with the minus sign. Okay. Um, so this feedback network, I call it, it's just a circuit. It's circuit elements. It could be a resistor or two. It could actually be a capacitor or an inductor. It's just some connection that goes from the output of the op amp back to the inverting input, okay? So, so that's a big takeaway here. If you have some path, right, some path you can trace from the output uh, to the inverting input, then you have a circuit with negative feedback. That's the key, and I'll show you an example or two. I have a little asterisk there. There's some fine print that goes along with this statement. That path cannot be, I say, through a power supply node or a ground node. In other words, if I if I connect, you know, um, if my path that I draw with my finger through the schematic, you know, one of the nodes is a power supply or ground, uh, that's not a negative feedback path. And I'll show you that when we get to a comparator, how to tell the difference. That's that's the fine print here. So so once you have identified negative feedback, you know you're going down the left-hand side of this tree. And you're going to analyze this circuit uh, that has negative feedback with this approach that I'm about to show you. So number one, there, so there, I think there are three steps here. Number one, assume that the input differential voltage is zero volts. That is, this VID, assume it's approximately zero. Just call it zero for analysis purposes. And I'll, I'll show you why, why it's small, how small it does get when we do an example problem. But basically what happens is, let's suppose you have, um, you start out with an input differential voltage that is, it starts for, from zero and maybe it starts climbing to some big value like a volt. As that voltage, starts to climb, what happens is this output voltage also starts to climb, right? The output is AOL times the difference, VID. So as that output voltage starts to climb through this feedback network, it tends to increase the voltage at the inverting input. If you increase the voltage at the inverting input, that shrinks VID. And if VID is still positive, some significant positive value, this output continues to rise even more. And this output is going to rise until it shrinks this VID value to a very small value like microvolts, approximately zero. Um, and so, so the, the, the takeaway here is that if you have negative feedback and you're analyzing the circuit, assume VID is zero volts. It's really a few microvolts, but let's get to that later. Number two, assume that the input currents into the op amp, into those, those inputs, is, is zero amps. It's really not zero amps. It might be microamps, but it's really small. And this is because op amps typically have high impedance inputs. They look like really big resistors, like 100 megaohms to ground. So there's very little current going into the input. So let's assume that those inputs are zero. Number three, in the three-step process, analyze the circuit using KVL, KCL, Ohm's law, whatever you want to throw at it, okay? So what we're going to do now is work, I'm going to work an example problem on the whiteboard, uh, a circuit that has negative feedback, and I'm going to use these steps. VID equals zero, the currents into the input equals zero, and then use KVL, KCL, whatever. Um, professor? Okay. Yeah. What does it mean when it says that um, the path, like the circuit, can't 
be through a power supply node or a ground node? Does that mean it can't be attached to like another voltage source or? That's right. If you had a voltage source, if you had a node voltage defined along your path when you trace your finger, and I'll, I'll show you that, I'll show you an example when we get to comparators. Um, uh, if, if when you trace your finger around the circuit through components and, and one of the nodes is like five volts defined, five volts or something like that, or ground, that is not a feedback path because that node would be constrained to a constant value because of that source or that ground node. So the output of the op amp would not be able to affect the inverting inputs voltage because there's a defined voltage in between. Okay, and I think it's probably easier once we get to an example. I'll point that out okay. when we get to uh, inverting comparators with hysteresis. Okay, and can you explain again, like why um, I one and I two equal zero? Mm -hmm. Because going through mm -hmm. that, um, the circuit with the feedback network. So, so the so, and this is regardless regardless of whether an op amp has a negative feedback uh, path here. These inputs have very high impedance values. In other words, you can imagine right at this uh, non-inverting input, a big resistor like 100 mega ohms attached to ground, and then at this uh, inverting input, maybe a resistor 100 mega ohms, and then attached to ground. So if you applied, let's say, five um, five volts. To any one, to either one of these inputs, you had a five divided by a hundred million amps, right? Ohm's law. And five divided by a hundred million is usually really small compared to the voltages we're working with. So we assume that those currents are zero. Okay, and and we might see this later, so we can save it for later if we need sure. to. And if that's the case, then is our I one and I two just always zero? Yeah. Oh. They are. Yeah, they are. They're 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 really small. So if if you, if this if you have an op amp, a typical op amp, um, the currents into the op amp are about zero. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so let's let's do this. Let's switch over to the whiteboard. Okay, I'm going to show you an example circuit here, and it looks something like this. So let's start out by drawing the op amp. So just because of the way I want to draw this schematic, I've put the inverting input on top, the non-inverting input on the bottom here. Uh, it doesn't matter which which uh, either top or the bottom, you put either input. You just have to label the inputs with a plus or a minus to identify one is inverting, one is non-inverting. I happen to put it up top here. So um, I'm not going to show the power supply voltages. So just assume that this op amp is, is sufficiently powered. So there's my circuit. So I have an op amp that's powered. Um, I have two resistors in the circuit and I've defined an input voltage to this circuit and an output voltage from the circuit. And what I would like to do is uh, figure out what is the relationship between the output voltage and the input voltage. So 
v out equals some function of vn. Okay, where AV is the voltage gain of the circuit. Okay. Now I I, I used another uh, gain earlier. I, I said I said there's this other gain called uh, AOL. So AOL is equal to V out over VID, if you remember that, right? V out equals VID times AOL. So VID, that's actually the difference between voltages at the inputs of the op amp. That's a different voltage than this input over here. So this input, V in, is actually the input to the circuit, right? There's a resistor in the way uh, between V in and, and the input voltage to the op amp here. So those are two different voltages. What we're going to find is this gain of the circuit AV, this voltage gain V out over V in, or some equation that says V out equals something times V in. That's what we want to find here. So find the voltage gain. That's what we want to find here. Okay. So I need, I need some equation. I've got to write some equation. Well, let me start out here. Let's follow those steps that I just uh, laid out on the slides. Okay, first, check if this circuit has negative feedback. If it has negative feedback, you're going to go down the left-hand side of that tree. I claim this circuit does have negative feedback. Why is that? Because there's some connection between the output of the op amp and the inverting input, right? The one with the minus sign. So R2 provides that negative feedback path. Uh, so this circuit has negative feedback. Because of that, I can say that the input differential voltage, plus minus, right? That's VID, is zero volts. Approximately, it's actually a few microvolts, I'll show you that, but close enough. The input currents here into the op amp are, are, are zero amps. Both of those are zero amps. That's step two. Step three is now analyze the circuit using those constraints. It's called a summing point constraint. But using those constraints, um, solve for V out equals something times Vn, which means I need a, I need an equation where I have uh, uh, V out, Vn, those two variables, and then all other variables are known. Well, let's assume that I know R1 and R2. I'm looking at the circuit. R2 might be 5k ohms. R1 might be 1k ohms, something like that. Let's assume R1 and R2 are known values. Okay. I think that I can write an equation at, uh, at this node, this node in the upper left here. I think I can write a KCL equation that has the variables V in, V out, and R1 and R2. And let's, let's give that a shot. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to sum the currents uh, leaving this node. So I'm going to sum the current leaving through the resistor R1, the current leaving into the op amp, which is zero, and the current leaving the node through R2. Okay, so that's my KCL. Okay, the current leaving to the left uh, from this node to Vn is, right, from node voltage analysis, the voltage, the node voltage at this node minus Vn over R1. Well, Let's think a bit about what the node voltage is at this node. I have, I know I have zero volts between the non-inverting input and the inverting input, right? There's no difference in voltage between 
this node where my pen is and this node, right? Those two nodes have zero volts between them. I know that this one node here connected to the non-inverting input is at ground, so that is a zero volts node voltage. Right, this is zero volts right here, this node. There's zero volts between that node and the node right above it, right? That's what we say here, zero volts. So that means that this node up here is also at a node voltage of zero volts. Okay. Okay, so I just figured out what the node voltage is of, well, this upper left node here. So now I can write my KCL equation. Let's sum the currents leaving that node. So zero minus V in over R1 is the current leaving to the left through R1. The current leaving into the op amp is zero. The current leaving from left to right through R2 is zero minus V out, right? This whole node here is V out. Zero minus V out over R2. Okay, so I sum the currents leaving that node and set it to zero, KCL. Okay, so now I can rearrange this equation a bit. Uh, let's see here. I can say, uh, so now I have what I want. I have V out, V in, and a couple known values, R1 and R2. So V out uh, over R2 equals minus V in over R1. Okay, so I get this equation, uh, V out equals minus R2 over R1 V in. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, v out equals something times V in. That means that V out over V in, which is equal to AV, that's what we're looking for, the gain, is equal to minus R2 over R1. So I have, I have uh, created a circuit where if you apply an input voltage, it multiplies that input voltage by minus the ratio of these two resistors and gives you an output voltage. Okay, that's what this is showing. The multiplier by which uh, Vn is, uh, is, well, is multiplied is minus R1 over R2, that's the gain, that's the voltage gain. Okay. If I were to if I were to draw this, let's draw this as kind of a, a plot here. Let's call that V out, let's call this uh, time. Oh, no, let's just call that voltage. I'm gonna put both voltages. This is voltage. This is time. Let's put a sine wave in here. Say so the sine wave looks like that. Let's call that V in. Uh, let, let's make it one volt, right? So it's a one volt peak. And then let's make up some values. Let's say R2 is equal to 5k ohms, R1 equals 1k ohm. That means AV equals minus five, right? So the output is going to be minus five times the input. So I could draw it like this. So minus five times that input would look something like this. And so this would peak out at five volts and minus five volt, five volts there. Okay, so if you built this, 
with that chip I showed, you've created an amplifier that would take a one volt input, one, pole, one volt peak input, and produce a, well, five volt peak output, but inverted. Okay, it's an inverted waveform. It's inverted because, well, it's flipped around the, the T-axis there. This, this, is, this has a name. This amplifier has a name. It's called an inverting amplifier. I'll try to write it up here, not mess up. All right, so that's what this is, an inverting amplifier. This is a common amplifier. You'll see these electrical engineers will use these, this configuration, an op amp with the resistors in this configuration in order to produce uh, an amplifier with a negative gain, okay? Any questions on, on how I did this analysis to get the gain? Uh, this isn't on a how, Professor, but I'm wondering what's um, what's the use of inverting amplifiers? Like, why would you specifically want the output to be inverted, like in sign from the input? Um, you know, it, because you can uh, you can actually implement analog signal processing with these amplifiers. Um, if you wanted to, for for example, implement an equation that had a negative coefficient, okay, um, you could do that. That's that's pretty abstract. Maybe you might want to do that or not. But but let me let me hold off on the answer to that. Let me let me say this. Let me point this out about this amplifier. This amplifier can have a gain that goes. Uh, let's see. Its its lowest magnitude gain could be zero, right? Uh, if you make R two equal to zero ohms or just a wire, then the gain is going to be zero. Like R one is one k ohm. R two is zero, then you have a gain at zero. From there, you can increase. So I can turn the gain all the way down to zero and then turn its magnitude up from zero. So let me, let me defer that question. I'll talk about that when we talk about the next amplifier, but just remember that this gain could actually be turned down to zero, like let's say a, a, an amplifier, adjustable amplifier for volume where you want to turn the gain down to zero. Okay, so, but, but hold on to that question for one minute. Okay. Okay. So that's one kind of, of amplifier. And now that you know this amplifier, now that you've seen the schematic before, you could go down that left branch of the tree. You no longer have to analyze this particular circuit. This has become a, well, I'll say a common circuit for you because you know the gain, it's minus R2 over R1. So if you saw this circuit again, you don't have to go through this analysis. You could say, well, the gain of the amplifier this circuit is minus R2 over R1, or probably more generically, minus the feedback resistor divided by the series resistor that goes to the inverting input. So let me show you another example. Uh, this is gonna be a non-inverting amplifier. Oh, lost my video. Okay, so this amplifier uses an op amp. It looks like this. Okay, so that's a different kind of amplifier. So I have an op amp and two resistors, and I have uh, negative feedback because I have some connection between the output and the inverting input of the op amp, 
that does not go through a power supply or ground. Yeah, there's a ground here, but I've got a resistor separating the ground node from this intermediate node that is along my path. So this circuit has negative feedback. Let's do the same thing. Let's find AV, find the voltage gain AV, or V out equals something times V in. Okay, so let's, let's try that same approach. Let's uh, write a KCL equation at this node where the inverting input is, because I think that equation is going to have V out, V in, and these resistor values, which are known. Okay. Uh, it, won't be, it won't always be the case where you use a KCL equation at the inverting input. You'll see that in your homework, but in this case, it'll work. Let me point something out here. Since we have negative feedback, we can say that this voltage is zero volts, right? That's step one. Step two is just be, because this is an op amp, not because of negative feedback, but you have zero amps going into the op amp. And then step three, analyze the circuit. Okay, let me point out, just like I did over here, I said, well, if there's zero amps between ground and that other node, that other node is, or since there's zero volts between ground and that other node, the other node is, is zero volts. I, I, can, I can do the same kind of um, analysis here. I can say, well, I have zero volts between these two in input nodes of the op amp. I know the node voltage of this top left node is V in. There's zero volts between this top left node and kind of this middle left node here. There's zero volts between those. So this middle left node is also node voltage V in, right? Because there's, there's no voltage difference between the top node and that middle left node. I can use that in a KCL equation. So let's do that. So my KCL equation would say something like this. Let's sum the currents leaving this this node here, let's sum that current and that current. Okay, so the current going into the op amp is zero. The current leaving down through R1 is V in minus zero over R1. The current leaving to the right through R2 is V in minus V out over R2. And that equals zero. Okay, so now uh, let's see if I multiply, well, let's do this. Let's say V out or V in over R1 plus V in minus V out over R2 equals zero. Let me multiply top and bottom by R1, R2, or, well, both sides of this equation by R1, R2. So left side times R1, R2, the right side times R1, R2, you get R2 Vn plus R1 Vn minus R1 V out equals zero. And so what you wind up with is this, you get V, uh, if you rearrange that equation, you get V out equals Move that to the other side. Something like that. And so that means you could re re rewrite this V out equals one plus R2 over R1 and find that times V in. Okay, so that's there's 
there's a takeaway equation for this amplifier. And you could also see that the gain AV equals one plus R2 over R1. Okay. So this, this amplifier, this is a non-inverting amplifier because it does something like this. It has a positive gain value so that the output would be a non-inverting version of the input. Okay, and the gain is one plus R2 over R1. Okay, let me go back to the question, well, why would you want an inverting amplifier? Well, what if I want a gain less than one? Like, again, I want to, I want to attenuate, I want to turn down the, uh, the, the volume down to zero. The non-inverting amp doesn't let you do that. The minimum gain that you can have, magnitude, is one. You make R2 equals zero, and maybe make R1 1K ohms, and AV equals one. So you will always, the smallest you can make the output is equal to the input. If you wanna build an amplifier that maybe you're turning down the microphone volume all the way to zero, right, so it doesn't amplify the speakers, uh, you could use an inverting amplifier to do that. And this gain actually can go down to zero. Okay. All right. So I think we've exhausted our time, I've exhausted my time here anyway. Um, so let's end here. We'll continue talking about operational amplifiers next time and how to solve them, how to solve those circuits. So uh, in closing, lab six, don't forget that's due this Friday and pre-lab seven, Lab seven are posted for this week. Uh, the exam will be next week. Take a look at Canvas. Take, keep an eye on the announcements. I will announce when the review problems are up and information about the exam. So uh, thanks for joining class. I hope it's working out well. If it's not, if anything isn't, please let me know. And what I'll do is start office hours in a minute or two. And if I don't see you there, I'll see you next time.